Yeah, Patrick told me I was screaming. Okay. okay. <laughs> Someone just came in and left immediately. Uh, I have far too many slides, so I'm going to start. It's, it's fine. Um, so this is a talk about Quick. Quick is a new next generation internet transport protocol. It's designed to replace um, the TCP TLS stack altogether. We apologize for the screen for the noise. Uh, replace the TCP TLS stack. It offers a number of technical improvements over TCP. It gives you native encryption and authentication and improvements to the protocol that support congestion control. It gives the layering of new protocols and services. Quick has the ability to expand and grow in a way that TCP just doesn't. But probably more importantly, it has a ton of political will and enthusiastic backing by a lot of developers. There's not this isolation of like 12 people in the world that can work on TCP. And so Quick has really sucked the air out of the TCP room. All the current work looking at improving transport protocols is looking to Quick first. And I can't really say if Quick's going to win here and take over the world, um, but it's probably unfair now to ignore the the strides it has made against you know what was already established. For Quick's development and standardization, Linux was the platform of choice, <clears throat> and it's been tuned and improved to compete against TCP TLS on on Linux. Implementation developers do care about portability, but Linux developers don't really seem to care so much about that. They want us to keep up with them. Quick is painfully full of puns and jokes about speed and different implementations, and I couldn't resist joining them, and so I called this talk Making FreeBSD Quick. Uh, I'm Tom Jones. I'm the FreeBSD Engineering Manager at Clara Inc. We do uh, FreeBSD development and support, and if you want either of these, come speak to me later. I'll happily tell you about what we do. I'm a call myself a recovering internet engineer because I've not been to the ITF for like six months. Um, before I joined Clara in 2022, I was in academia at the University of Aberdeen, where I worked on internet uh, standards and internet transport protocols. And I did a lot of standardization in the ITF. And so I wrote a couple of RFCs, um, one of them on the UDP services and APIs, another one on getting big packets through networks. Um, and through that, I tried to bring new standards to FreeBSD. And throughout all of this, I, you know, I wanted to make the internet better. The web lost all hope, but the internet, we can actually make it better. I, I say I'm one eighth of the BSD Now podcast hosting team. I can explain the mass of that later. We're going to do a live show this afternoon, which, which we've prepared for about as much as we normally do, which is to say not very much. So it should be fun. And we're going to encourage a lot of heckling there. So if you want to come heckle, come heckle. My last few years in academia were working on making sure that Quick would work well in satellite networks, especially geo satellite networks. Satellite networks have a, a ton of problems which have been solved the last 30 years by breaking TCP, uh, literally breaking TCP and running a separate protocol with just a proxy at either end. And Quick make that impossible. And so I spent a lot of time building test beds to verify that no, the sky's not falling, Quick will work. Um, but there are things we can tune. And through that, I ran a lot of IPerf sessions and I did a lot of performance measurements and testing. And I hit against a lot of people that don't know how to do any sort of performance measurements and testing. So really this talk is an introduction how to do some network performance evaluation. This is like a bottomless pit that you can dig into, but it's gonna be a nice gentle introduction. It doesn't go super into the weeds anywhere, but it should give you a reasonable amount of rigor if you wanna apply performance testing for network stuff uh, later on. And I built this test bed out and these experiments to answer questions like, is Quick on Linux faster than Quick on FreeBSD? With you know the secret goal of, well, if it is faster, what can we steal for FreeBSD so that we are staying competitive? So we don't you know have a narrative, don't use FreeBSD, it doesn't work well with Quick. Before we do anything fun, we have to do some background. Um, I'm going to use the word transport protocol several times, and it's good to explain what transport protocols are. Transport protocols are how we move useful information around the internet. They sit on top of uh, network protocols like uh, IP, and that lives on top of link layer protocols, which do weird things with electrons and who knows. The most uh, common protocol used sort of until maybe five years ago um, is TCP. It's still responsible for the majority of internet traffic. There's like a citation needed there now. I'm not quite sure because Facebook have made some big claims. Um, but it's been very core to how the internet has evolved. It offers a really simple API and some nice guarantees. It gives you a reliable in-order byte stream, which means you put bytes in one end and they come out the other end the order you put them in. 
nothing changes. And if they do change, well, then you've hit something interesting or you're imagining things. After some issues at the end of the 80s, we added um, congestion control to make sure that TCP would behave fairly on the network with other users. TCP gives us a single stream. Um, and it works as a simple building block. And so a simple network abstracted application could almost just replace the file access for interactivity. You could get most of the way there. Um, and so it did a lot of work. And so we saw tons of applications built on top of this. And the power of these applications and their deployment came from the API and the network model, and it worked out really well. But things have changed, and encryption authentication had to be layered on top. And, and TLS in the form of SSL did a lot of this. But we also have some issues. Reliable and in order means that if there, we lose packets in the middle of a transmission, we're stuck waiting for the middle of the transmission to arrive. The world stops. Everything blocks out. Um, um, and so that leads to some issues. And it, it's led to lots of hacks and other weird developments. The other protocol, and one I've spent far too much of my life reading about, is UDP. Um, UDP is you know, used everywhere, and I'm sure you know about it, but it's also hard to pin down what it's used for. Um, you know, it's frequently used in DNS um, for some modes of communication, DHCP, um, RTP for video streaming, TFTP, and UDP lives as a substrate underneath a ton of other stuff. So there's a lot of proprietary protocols that you've probably never dealt with. Um, you might see their names in Wireshark, um, but you won't necessarily know what they are. And it's used as a substrate for a lot of other stuff. There was a giant war around the time of Quick in the ITF about a protocol called Plus, which you could go read about, but it's not fun. UDP offers a really minimal service. The UDP RFC is two pages long. I once put it on slides and somebody laughed at me, but the whole thing is real, real quick. It offers transmission and reception of packets, and it offers multiplexing. That's it. That's all you get. Everything else you have to bring yourself. There's some other bits, um, but really it is a tool for the user, the user being the, the, the programmer, to build more protocols. This lightweight protocol means it's great for using as a substrate and it's great for carrying other stuff. And it lets it run in all sorts of places. You can run with basically no computational power. You can read bytes out of a packet as they arrive. You don't have to hold any state. The protocol carries no state in itself. So compared to TCP, where we have sequence numbers and act fields, none of that's there. UDP really is um, some addresses and support numbers, and that, that's all you're getting. It's unreliable, which is great when you don't want your packets to arrive. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some people don't. And it's the vehicle for multicast, but I, I'm not sure multicast is a real thing. I think it's just an elaborate joke. <laughs> there are other transport protocols. Transport protocol development didn't stop in the 80s and everyone took 50 years off. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a big effort through uh, telcos and the IETF to standardize something called SCTP. FreeBSD is the home of one of the few SCTP stacks that exist. Um, it offered a ton of enhancements and lessons learned from, I guess at that point, 20 or 30 years of TCP usage in the real world. It gives you reliable in order byte streams, but it also gives you multi-streaming, so you can have multiple streams run in parallel. It gives you multi-homing, and it gives you multi-path, so you can have failover between interfaces, or you can concurrently use two paths. It's used a lot in telephony networks and is part of WebRTC. Uh, you should have it if you have Chrome. You will have FreeBSD's SCTP stack running over UDP in your web browser to enable data channels for SCTP. This is why your Zoom calls work. Um, the IETF had a big crisis of conscience about SCTP through its development. And for a long time, it was just going to be tunneled over UDP. And then they changed their mind and gave it an IP protocol number. And this, with the state of NATs at the start of the, like the late 90s and the early 2000s, meant that nobody had any confidence that this would work in the internet at all. And so it had a real smattering of adoption. Um, some of the FreeBSD SCTP developers have asked me many times, like, why would anybody use Quick? It doesn't give us anything new. Um, there's just a, a political war there. And SCTP lost this fight in the internet. It won in telcos, but it's now losing in telcos. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Future will be fun. OK, Quick. So this is a talk about Quick, I guess. Um, Quick is a new transport protocol. It offers a reliable in-order stream service. So it allows you to put bytes in and come out the other side. It gives you multi-streams, multi-homing. There's work in progress on doing multi-path. The difference between Quick and SCTP or Quick and TCP is that it has always on authentication and encryption. Every Quick 
packet is encrypted and authenticated. There is no zero cipher mode. Everything is always encrypted. You're stuck with this. This scares a lot of network operators. We're, we're dead. We're, we're moving forwards. Um, Quick's a framed protocol, which means it can carry multiple different types of data, which gives it extensibility. The extensibility is super powerful. Um, one of the extensions to Quick is an unreliable datagram service. So with your on top of UDP, your unreliable protocol, you can run a reliable protocol and get an unreliable service again. Um, and <laughs> this service is real good. Um, the extensibility is very powerful. And it led to Apple deploying um, private internet relays globally without anyone knowing they were doing this development. And they used um, one of the quick models for this. They just they managed to do it. And it rolled out to you know a billion users. So it, it's, it's had some great stuff. I mean, Facebook have talked about um, doing terabytes a second of quick for uh, interconnect. It is a protocol that's becoming established. It's, it's cool. It's fun. It might be the future. We're going to look at network performance and the performance of quick. And so we need to talk about background about how we talk about network performance. Um, I'm going to say generally that performance is, the, is a measure of a system's ability to do useful work. And we typically talk about performance and how it compares to some ideal or some baseline. We say something performs better than something else. You can't just say something performs well. It's a, a great statement. When we're looking at the performance of systems or we're trying to tune something to be as performant as possible, we want to set the bottleneck, so the limit for what we can do to be the most expensive thing. Ideally, we'll just buy stuff to make things go faster. But if we're going to have to do a lot of work, we want to find the thing which is the most difficult to replace. For a network engineer, the network is always the thing I'm going to want to optimize. Because if I can saturate the network, then the other stuff can be dealt with by somebody else. And if we want to look at the performance of different things, then TCP is really fast and really efficient. And so we want to be able to have a fair comparison about how TCP will go. We look at network performance and we talk about loads of different measures. And so the main measure we're going to talk about today is um, throughput. It might be good put. So throughput is um, the, the network's ability to move packets. So it's a bits per second measure where we talk about how the, the whole thing will go through. Headers included the whole lot. Um, we can also talk about good put, which is the number SCP or curl is going to tell you when you're doing a download because it can't see the headers. It has no idea. So it talks about the application data that comes through. Yeah. Uh, for these measures, they don't really matter because I guess we're looking at good put, but it's, it's actually not so important. Um, we also look at things in uh, packets per second when we're talking about routing benchmarks. Um, and you could look at this for certain quick models of usage. Um, we can talk about concurrent connections. And so there was a big thing in the mid 2000s. When I talk about the mid-2000s and early 90s, I'm talking about things from when I was quite young, so I don't have a lot of direct experience. Um, but there was a big um, discussion about the C10K problem where we want to run 10,000 concurrent connections on a box. And then we got up to a million concurrent connections on a box. And so this is the world that Quick needs to grow into. And so we need to be able to build comparisons against these. For looking at performance, we have great tools that already exist. Um, I'm a big fan of iperf3. It builds a lot on iperf2, even if it might give you lower result numbers, it's much better. It will give you output in JSON, which just makes everything easier. Um, for packet per seconds tests, there's packet gen in the FreeBSD tree, which will do a ton of packet generation. And that's good. It works well. And for looking at things like concurrent connections, we need to almost go up a layer. We need to talk about application services. And I find work is quite a good tool for this. But I think there's a lot of research which could be done for looking at how to measure concurrent connections and how they apply to networks in 2023, rather than things that we've just built in the last 20 years. When we do a performance test, we want to figure out what the network can do, and we want to run. It wasn't me. Um, we want to run existing tools. There's a good reason to run existing tools because we have some idea that they will actually work and that the numbers they give us are correct. If we build our own tooling to measure things, we're always going to have a question if our tools are any good. I built my own toolings to measure things, so I don't know why I've included this, because it makes me look bad. Um, but it does help us understand what the network can do. We want to measure at the lowest level we can. We want to have as few parts if we're setting a baseline for a network. And so my baseline measurements are done with iperf, because they give us very clean TCP and UDP numbers. But compared to quick, we get something else. And in reality, my tests aren't looking at how quick is used. It's just looking at the protocol sending bytes. Um, and so you end up layering more stuff up. As you add layers, you add error to your measurements. And if you can't quantify the error, you can sometimes get to very interesting points where you have no idea what your results mean. 
Throughput tests are a real straightforward method for looking at what your network will do. It sends data for a fixed time, or it tries to send at a fixed rate. Um, when we send a fixed amount of data, we measure how long it takes, and that tells us how fast it went when we divide it by the time. As quickly as possible for these tests is normally saturating the CPU. So we aim to use as much processing as we can, unless we're going to hit a network bottleneck. Um, for a network test, you want to exclude everything else. And so you don't want to have to worry about disks. And that's why it's good to use existing tools, which have avoided all the other stuff which might be there. iPro3, my, I love iPro3. iPro3 runs as a client and server. iPro3 runs as a combined server for all the protocols it supports. And so uh, you run the server and it listens for a control connection. I think the control connection comes over TCP. The client and the server will negotiate how they're going to run the test. This allows you to do things like change, uh, for TCP, change the congestion control algorithm. You can change different parameters for SCTP. Um, once the test parameters are agreed, by default, the client starts sending, uh, which will confuse you if you're trying to measure your home internet connection because it will be your uplink rather than the downlink. So you can flip that. Um, and it gives, it runs for some time. By default, it runs for 10 seconds and it gives you uh, a measurement every second and then an average at the end. Um, nice and quite simple to use. For quick performance, we've got to do something else. So quick is designed to sit anywhere you would run TCP with HTTP. And it's it's grown, but it's it's designed to run there. And so it, it should have been optimized for throughput and requests per second and concurrent connections. But quick is a transport protocol. And a lot of these parts start to become application protocols like a web server, because it's I don't know if it means a lot to say my FreeBSD machine can do 10,000 connections a second, but it can do 12 HTTP requests a second. I don't know if we get a, a, a nice like measurement there. Um, through Quick's development, it, it grew. And about 18 months before standardization, there started to be work to build a um, performance mm -hmm. measurement process for Quick, just looking at Quick, not looking at HTTP. Uh, that came too late for the measurements I want to do, which I'll explain. So I wasn't able to include that process. Um, instead, Fastly did some work early on because there was a lot of complaints about, you know, Quick is going to ruin the internet. Um, and they wrote a blog post because there is CDN, so they didn't have to write a paper. They wrote a blog post called Can Quick Match TCP's Computational Efficiency? And they looked at a single core performance to see what 100% throughput would be. But they clocked the core down to 400 megahertz, and they did some other things which make it really difficult to replicate without the same hardware as them. OK, science is a performance. So with all the background out of the way, what, what are we going to try and do? Well, I want to answer one question, really, which is, is Quick on Linux faster than FreeBSD? And then I want to steal the answer. Like, what did they do? What did the Quick developers do to make this go quicker? <laughs> Pun. Um, and, and what can we take from this? So how will we approach? Well, I want to look at the performance of how a Quick so one implementation changed during its lifetime. And I want to look at the average throughput for a Quick connection. During Quick's development, there were, what's the right words? Um, during Quick's development, things broke constantly because it was a protocol in development. Like, things kept falling over. Uh, but the one thing they kept constant was they had tests for doing throughput. And so we can look at their own throughput tests, and we get to fairly measure what the developers were seeing. Not what the protocol can do, not how we could build an application that would go faster, but what the developers were seeing. Um, it's interesting to hit what the developers were seeing, because we'll see what the developers tried to tune. And if we get what the developers tried to tune, then we might get an answer for how to go faster. And so. I'm going to measure the performance of quick connections. I'm going to use CPU saturation as a proxy for network saturation. So the, the later measurements will explain some of this. But basically, our UDP sender isn't able to saturate my test network. It uses 100% of a core, but it doesn't fill it out. So we need to then extrapolate from there to figure out what um, we need to extrapolate from what a protocol which can saturate the network would do and how fast it could go. And so we're going to make comparisons against that. So when you, the graphs are confusing, that will be why. To run these tests, we need to build up a test bed, which we think is reasonably representative of real world usage, or at least describable in a way which is reproducible for someone else to do it, or described in a way that someone else can build a different test bed, and they can make performance comparisons to my test bed. 
which is a lot of uh, provisos, but I couldn't figure out how to buy the NUC, the fastly used, and scale down a processor to match the same. But I can figure out how to make my computer go as fast as possible, and then you can compare it to a different computer going as fast as possible. We want to measure system load during tests. Because we're going to use the CPU saturation as a, a proxy variable for looking at performance, we need to make sure we're saturating with CPU. Or if we're not saturating with CPU, how much we're using and record that accurately. We pull in some baseline measurements so we know how fast we should be able to go. Baseline measurements are good because if you exceed them with a test, you might have done something very wrong in your baseline measurements. And so you might have broken everything. So it's good to test. And then finally, we need a quick to measure, a quick to measure and some sort of methodology to follow, which will give us consistent results. So my test bed is made of ASCII art. Um, it's, it's got two <clears throat> identical machines uh, configured as left and right. They both dual boot FreeBSD and Ubuntu. And there's a control node which controls the orchestration of the experiments and collection of data. Uh, for all these tests, we've used um, all these tests, the, we have Linux uh, as a constant on one side, and then we switch between FreeBSD and Linux. So we're trying to keep the variable space down so we can see how things change. Um, accidentally including a ton of variables is a mistake people will make a lot in how they do performance tests. And you have to be real rigorous, and it, it takes a lot of effort. The machines for these tests are an identical build of AMD Ryzen 3800X systems. They have the same motherboard, RAM, SSDs, um, graphics card, network interfaces. The difference between them is the cases, because I couldn't buy the same case again. I don't know if that's a problem. If there's something real weird in my results, I'm going to blame it on that, but I think it's OK. <laughs> it could be slightly different performance because of different <laughs> Exactly, yeah. So the one risk is the thermal difference, but FreeBSD doesn't have great tools for measuring that, so I didn't look. I want to. I want to find out it didn't work. Um, <laughs> you could, but I'd have to like unplug cables or something. Um, but yeah, so they're they're set up to basically be identical as as best as I can to a reasonable level. Which, yeah, if you if you were going to build out a test bed, you could buy stuff at the same time. But I bought these six months apart, uh, and it was real hard figuring out why the. 3700X I got was slower than the 3800X I had to buy in the second machine. So I just bought another 3800 to make them the same. That, that was easier than debugging. <laughs> this test bed is not ideal. This is not um, what you should build if you're a company doing internet measurements. You don't, don't buy this. I've used gaming class computers because I wanted to see if I could save a lot of money and build a reasonable test bed. Like I've been cheap. Um, I have a, a limited budget and I built this out. The testbed machines are small. They're not huge machines. They're not comparable to a modern server. They're 2017 processors. The network interfaces I have are not super fast either. They're 10 gig interfaces. I'd like to put 100 gig interfaces in, but they are the same price as the machine. And so we, we hit the... Yeah, they're cheap, Christoph. <laughs> cheap machines. So. Um, yeah, so the, the builds themselves, I think, are in the range of... Um, maybe $800, and the 100 gig interfaces I could see for sale are like $800. So it, 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 the, the budget didn't work out. If Christoph's going to send me 100 gig interfaces, that'd be great. I'm not going to send you any, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> one problem here we have, though, is we can't replicate a third of the internet traffic in a test bed. No, no one can do this. Someone might, but no one can do this. Um, Performance testing like this, normally in industry, you, you do steering. So if you have a, a large load balancing system, you'll steer test traffic in, and you'll see what the performance is over an aggregate. But I, I can't do that. I don't have 100 gigabit a second of traffic to look at. I don't know how I would deal with that. It would take up a lot of time. Um, but instead, we can look at other proxies. And so we're looking at CPU saturation, and we want to look at the single th single thread performance of, of a quick. Um, and this is good limitation, actually, because this is how Quick was developed. It was developed on this implementation was developed on one guy's laptop, and he carried it around the world. Um, and so we're being fair to how things were developed to draw our conclusions. 
And you know, we care about how quick implementation involved, and so that guess is there. Measuring system load is great fun. I looked at the Fastly paper about how they looked at the performance of Quick, and then I looked at everything else I could find where people had used um, CPU utilization as reported by the system for doing performance measurements. And nobody, nobody said at all how they did it, ever. Um, I think they eyeballed top. I think they just looked at top and said, yep, that's a core. And, and that raises doubts because it doesn't scale. I don't want to sit here all day. These measurements take 30 seconds, 45 seconds each. But you know, you need to run a good number of them to get any sort of statistics about it. And I look at it quite a lot of commits in quick. And I looked at a thousand commits at one day, one day. I'm not going to do that um, by hand looking at top. So we need to, to write some tools. So I looked at what top does. Um, top's nice, very friendly. Uh, I can't believe it wasn't in FreeBSD 1. It had to come as a port. Um, it reads a sysctl to determine uh, memory usage, process, processor activity, process counts, all the great stuff you see. Um, and it looks at the sysctl current.cp time for an overall view of what the scheduler has reported about where things have been used. And for multi-core systems, it reports current.cp times, which are the same five values, one for each processor. They account for usage since the system has booted. I don't think they can be zeroed. And so you need to read them twice to get an idea about what's happened. Always going to read them twice. It does some maths like this. Um, this is how I worked out what the active time would be. I basically summed up the deltas. And this will tell you what's going on. And I have this as a shell script, which I should share more publicly. With a test bed in place and a methodology, we need to figure out what the systems can do. And we come back to iPerf for looking at what the system will do. Um, this is what iPerf tells you. Um, the sum of the slides I have elided from here went through a whole rigmarole about the FreeBSD scheduler and how it bounces processors around and sort of ruined all my measurements. Linux doesn't do this. Um, so there's a CPU set there. Hopefully, this will get fixed. Um, TCP for a straight back-to-back -back connection on the same um, uh, DAC between two network interfaces a meter apart gives us 9.3-ish gigabits a second for about 22% of a core. So it's not saturating the CPU for the send, it's saturating out the network. I think that's close to the theoretical limit of a 10 gig connection. Um, but yeah, so we're not getting there. I think if you do the maths, we get to about 42 gigabit per second, which would be quite nice to get. And if I had 100 gig interfaces, I could try. But it rules out getting 25 gig interfaces. UDP is a different story. Um, UDP goes a lot slower. iPerf, by default, when you run a UDP measurement, will send one megabit per second. So you might get tra tricked by this if you don't know. Uh, you need to give it a target rate to aim for. So I told it to aim for 10 gigabit a second. Um, and we run through a test. And for 100% of a core, we did about 6.3 gigabit a second. So this raises a really good question. TCP and UDP have been around for a long time. Why is UDP so much slower? And it comes down to one of the main boogeymen of the internet and system administration for the last however many years, wow. uh, which is TSO. TCP segment offload is a way for um, a sender to just give the network card a ton of data and say, do the work for me. You pass from the network stack to the card a big chunk and you say where it should be divided and what the header looks like for these divisions. And it can be hardware accelerated. So it's hardware accelerated, it goes fast. It saves us context switches, it saves us transfers to the card, it lets everything, lets us do less work to send more bytes. And so things go well. If we turn off TSO, then for about 100% of a core, I don't know why I didn't hit 100%, for about 100% of a core, we can do eight gigabit a second, which is still faster than UDP. And my thesis advisor really wanted me to write a kernel driver which just sent UDP as fast as possible, but I didn't want to do that. So I don't know where this delta is. It would be interesting to know, but it might be good to look at uh, easier to debug system because my desktop grade Ryzen doesn't have great performance counters to look at things like this. Okay, we're now halfway through the time and we're gonna talk about quick. There are a lot of quick implementations. They all have stupid names, all of them. Um, some grew and died, some survived the whole time, some are in production. Um, I looked at Fastly's quick implementation quickly, which ruined my spelling of the word quick for two years, but I spelled it right today the first time. Um, it's a stupid pun on their own name, but it's still better than the implementation called quiche. 
Um, I retroactively wrote a long justification for why we chose quickly. We chose quickly because it's written in C and the developers are nice to us. Um, but I had to justify this to the European Space Agency, so I wrote more stuff. But basically, it's written in C. The developers were active throughout the entire quick development process. Um, one of the original quick implementers at Google went to Fastly and then carried the document for um, quick transport all the way through. And so they had a constant development process, which matches well with what we're trying to do. And um, there's solid prior work. I don't know if it's solid prior work. I wrote that. I wrote a, a tool to look at how um, quick evolved over time and looking at it quickly. And because we need to run network experiments, it needed to be a distributed tool. And because we we're going to build a lot, it needed to do a lot of things. So I called it Committerate because I just hate not I hate naming things well. Um, and it's a single stop tool which handles connections and running experiments, building and configuring on the test hosts, coordinating the star and experiments, and it will grab measurements during an experiment run. So for these experiments, it's just pulling in um, CPU utilization, but it, I also set it up so I could do D-trace profiling while tests ran um, automatically. It connects up the data at the end and pulls it all back and then gives you a mangled CSV file you have to put into Google Sheets. I wrote it in Python using um, the Fabric library. Don't do this, it was terrible. There's nothing else to use, but this was terrible. Commit rate will take a list of commits to evaluate, and for each commit, it will connect to a pair of machines. Um, this is definitely hard-coded to be a pair of machines. Uh, it connects to a, a client and a server. Um, it creates a, a git work tree for each commit so that I have an artifact on the server so that when strangeness happens in developing the experiments, I can go and investigate what the hell is going on. It builds both, and it will look for build failures. And so the commit rate tool is how I selected the commits I eventually evaluated. So it, it does both. I initially wanted to do um, a binary search across Quick to figure out where things sped up, but it was, uh, it was too much work. Um, it will run a fixed size transfer for a measurement and it will collect the time this took and the process utilization. From the time this took, we then calculate the average bit rate through this transfer. So we just get an average rate for how the connections work through. From August 2017, so about six months into Quickly's development, they added CMake to the build. Before then, it was something really weird. Um, <laughs> so we need to pick a commit that has CMake. And the general process for building Quickly is you grab the repo, you grab the submodules. So the developers also have a TLS wrapper around another TLS implementation. It doesn't use OpenSSL. Um, you do CMake, you generate keys, and you run a test. Running a test is, is quite straightforward. The, this is the Python for given the system commands we've run. The server side needs to be given keys and where to listen. And we want to suppress all the output because it's going to give you a lot of output. And the client side, there is a switch in here. And so before this commit date, there after this commit date, there was some standardization inside the quick developers for a common path in a quick server running the raw protocol so that you could run tests between them. But I want to look before this because I want the graph to cover more range. And so this is the only special case code for a quick version I have. And it just handles the lack of a .txt pass there. I did consider I would need to do build fixes, but oh no, there's another one for doing a build fix because we didn't include the right um, socket definitions for FreeBSD, but I, I fixed that. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to be more honest about what's in the tests. So if the results are weird, I don't get a barrage of questions like, why are you lying? Doing the, the build and generating the keys takes a long time. And it turned out it was really hard to do these steps in parallel. I was initially generating the SSL keys for every test uh, with every build, which wasn't very smart. Um, I was also pulling in the submodules, which were taking a long time. And right at the start, I was pulling them over my home internet connection, which is not good. Uh, and so I, I resolved some of these. Um, I wanted to do parallel builds because if I could build every commit in quickly, then it'd be really easy just to test them on my own whim. But I ended up hitting contention around a Git lock in work tree creation. And I didn't want to sacrifice having the build artifacts and the simplicity of using work trees for having um, 1,000 builds of a quick library on my computer. So this is where the trade-off came from. Quickly started in April 2017. Um, 
And up to sort of August last year, there were 2,100 commits in that time. They did not happen as like a normal development process. They happen in burst, or bursts around IETF meetings. And so before each IETF meeting, there is a hackathon and the quick uh, implementers would come to all the hackathons. And they had mid meetings as well. And so they, they would come through. And so you get a ton of activity around those times. And so looking chronologically didn't make sense. And instead I took steps through the commits. I, I think was looking at the evolution of the commit history is a good way to just look at how um, the changes came through. And if we had finer grain steps, we can actually see regressions. Uh, I don't think I managed to plot any of those out. The first stable commit I could find, which would work on FreeBSD and Linux, is this wonderful commit message. <laughs> which is just a C expression and then a Stack Overflow link. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what Kazuho was doing. Um, it worked for him. <laughs> I then ran Committery in sort of a, a binary search mode so I could find good commits. I filtered out bad commits where the uh, congestion control was broken because I don't think they were fair to look at for the performance. And so I basically filtered out outliers here. Um, the full set of commits is here on this slide, which I'm sure everyone loves reading git commit hashes. So there we go. Um, and this then gives us points to run from. And so with this, um, I could run committery in my test bed. I could heat up my office so it was nice and warm in the summer and we generate uh, an output and we get a plot like this. So from the, the left to the right, we have I'm marching on forever as it does. In red with dots, we have the performance measurements from FreeBSD. I'm giving the average rate. So we, because we've averaged this over time, we don't have a peak rate. And in purple with triangles, we've got the performance measurements from uh, Ubuntu 2204. Um, I also tried to look at normalizing this because if we want to compare to TCP, where we used you know, a fifth of a core for 100% CPU, um, we want to balance this out. So I came up with a metric called megabits per CPU percentage. So 1% CPU at 1 megabit per second would be 1 on here. So the four axes here are 25, 50, 75, and 100. 100 megabits per CPU percentage is 10 gigabits per second. Um, the lines that go above in blue and yellow are the Ubuntu and FreeBSD server side. So this is the sending side. And the lower lines are the measurements from the client side. And so I captured the utilization for both of these just so I could catch any uh, peculiarities in measurements. But we see the lines go together. And that's not what I expected to happen. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I was expecting there to be a stark difference between FreeBSD and Linux. Um, and we'd get to pull something useful from here. And I'm actually lying. So I did these measurements earlier with broken data. And I found that FreeBSD on a different test bed was a lot faster than Ubuntu on that same test bed. Those machines were taken away from me. But we've seen, you know, a gigabit and a half, a gigabit and a half a second faster on FreeBSD than Linux on these machines. And that made no sense. That's not what we should have had happen. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke to Kazuho, the, the author of Quickly, and I asked, you know, like, what well, the hell, man, what's going on? And and he he told me in Slack that um, yeah, I don't know what's going on, but you should look at GSO because GSO is much better. That's ever, that's what we've tuned. Um, so GSO was added in um, March 2020, but it's not a default for Quickly. So it wasn't caught in any of the tests for Linux, um, which is why we didn't see Linux going a lot faster. GSO is a generalized version of um, TCP segment offload. It was introduced in Linux in 2006 as the TSO code came in and has been updated since then to support UDP. Um, basically, it allows you to take the, so the socket data and just keep it together until the last possible point, and then it goes out through the NIC interface. For, for UDP, the Linux code supports 64 segments, and I don't know what that means in terms of how much data you can move. The define is just 64. Like UDP segment 64. So I'm not really sure how this works out and what they check. I didn't dig into it. Um, but yeah, it, it gives us some benefit. Um, and we can actually, uh, John Baldwin has hinted to me that some network interfaces can support this offload for UDP, but I'm, I'm not so sure. But if we run these experiments again with the handy tool we wrote that lets us do it and add them in, we see that with the new purple line above, 
that with GSO, we can go a lot faster for our quick sender. Our quick sender is, you know, approaching the limit we got in the UDP benchmark of six-ish gigabits per second. Um, and we're actually getting there. Um, and if we take the extrapolated number where we normalize to try and figure out what we would do if we had more CPU or more network, we're actually approaching the, the 10 gigabit a second limit if we, you know, extrapolate from these numbers. And we're way above, um, which is really cool. I think we need GSO for FreeBSD. Um, I have started working on this, but it's broken in so many ways. Um, I don't think MBUFFs work the way I thought they did. Um, there's some other stuff which might come through. John Baldwin was working on a generic receive offload, but when I last spoke to him about it earlier this year, it was actually slower than not using it. So there are either some bugs or there's a workload it needs to stimulate it that will work well. In the future, we're going to see more offload available for Quick. Uh, Intel were quite annoyed in Quick's development where it was because the Mac was tied for every packet, you couldn't do offload the same way for TCP. And Intel were very worried they wouldn't be able to accelerate it at all and, and said this you know, publicly. Um, and so there's some difficulties here. I've heard rumors, and I can't tell you who from, that there is quick offload coming in network cards. It'd be really cool to see that happen. But we also would need to cover a lot of ground for FreeBSD. Um, and that, that takes me here. This is the end of my presentation. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the uh, as a kind of uh, statistical measure of these comparisons. So you, you talk about peaks briefly. You also have packets that go much slower than the average. Um, would it make sense to look at that as well? I mean, I, I'm not sure what the data read looks like. In this, yeah, so in this network configuration, the packets can't go slower because it's two machines connected back to back. There's no buffering happening beyond the hosts. And so it generalized in the internet, packets can go slower as they encounter different bottlenecks, but on aggregate, they, they don't. They, packets will get approximately the same treatment um, as long as we ignore some complexities of the internet. Um, the, the peaks in throughput we could look at, but Quick is using a TCP style congestion control. Here it's using Cubic. Um, and so cubic is tuned to work with a certain buffer size and it tries to fill the buffer. And so we could look at the peak of the performance, but the performance of the network is defined as the, the length of the path and all of the buffers combined. And so if you have a lot of buffering, you can go faster for a time at the expense of latency. So your packets go slower, but you get to send faster and then you hit that limit and then everything slows down again. And so you could, but I, I'm not sure it would apply here. It wouldn't help for this measurement where we looked at how things evolved in the development because the developers weren't doing it. They were just running on their laptop and running tests against each other. And so it wouldn't reveal you know, some way that they tune stuff. Albert. Um, so you most, it seems you mostly com uh, compared the performance with um, Linux and FreeBSD, but we also did some TCP tests for comparison there. We all the pride with TLS because I mean most of the TCP traffic nowadays is encrypted, and so you have I mean yes, there is ANS and I, but it's still an overhead. Yeah, so this isn't a fair check again between the bottleneck and the quick traffic. I'm I'm happy to say that. Um, but it's almost hitting the baseline for UDP. Like it's it's actually almost there. And so while there is a, definitely a TLS overhead, I, I don't know if it would show uh, to be the limit limiting factor here. It doesn't. It's not the limiting factor there. Like we're not hitting the the ball. I mean, maybe it is. We could look at it. The we basically would then we would get a measurement based on the performance of the TLS encryption engine for however I measured. But I still I'm going to guess and say we would still saturate 10 gigabit. So it doesn't. But then give us a new result. Anyone else? Christoph. Have you tried any performance count measurements? You know, flame graph of where is the bottleneck in our network? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, Perf on Linux gives you excellent flame graphs with the whole system. Um, 
FreeBSD gives me these. <laughs> it's not great. Um, wherever, wherever this symbol is, is probably to blame. Oh, I'm using the wrong monitor. Um, you shouldn't be guessing symbols as of the kernel. Yeah, I, 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 I like these more. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't dig into this because the there's no difference, right? Like if we if we look here, we're running the same speed. We're running faster. So well, without yeah. GSO, we don't have a limitation that Linux has. You're running essentially the same code in user space. Yeah. So your performance difference is something in the code. Definitely, but we're going faster. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, and we could probably go. A lot, we could definitely go a lot faster. There's a ton of stuff that needs tuned. Um, Gleb has started tuning how um, UDP socket buffers are used. So I think he's going to move them to UIO ring. Yeah. Um, but I I didn't want to dig into that because I had to focus and deliver this thing. Um, but yeah, we're we're getting there. Did you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just I just leave this one. Um, I did a, a survey of Quicks in 2018, 2019 um, for the work we did for ESA, where we looked at 12 different Quicks, and they're not fun to run. They are all apart from quickly, they all bring their own build systems. They there's only three or four written in C. One of them is Microsoft's, which is uh, MBuff kernel compatible. I don't know why, um, but yeah, I, when we start talking about running Rust on FreeBSD, we are going to raise more questions and performance measurements between a Go quick implementation and a C quick implementation between FreeBSD and Linux are, if there are differences, it's going to be hard to attribute where they come from and the language is going to have an effect. <laughs> and FreeBSD is not necessarily tuned for all these cases the same way. Oh, I have more plots. But yeah. Okay, that's time. Thank you. <laughs>